It is 9.33, Wednesday, June 24th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm already looking forward to the return of baseball talk to our beloved horse racing podcast. And baseball, yeah, I don't know. Even this devout fan can't really get his arms around this mess that is the baseball season. So the salons, hair salons open in New Jersey on Monday. And I think mean, finally I can get a haircut. So I go into the old guy, he's been cutting my hair forever. You usually just walk in and he cuts your hair. Says, uh, there's a month wait. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? <laughs> John Green, general manager from DJ Stable. And if I was wearing a hat, I would give a tip of the hat to our friend Joe Bianca for graduating and doing a phenomenal interview on CBS. That was really, really well done. It, it, it almost, you know, I almost got, you know, a little choked up watching you on, on national uh, television. Good job, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, John. You finally arrived, Joe. <laughs> Alan Carrasso, managing editor of TDN. I don't know. I am looking forward to baseball. Here's Chicago Cubs baseball. Bring on 60 games. I'll, I'll take it. There you go. Good for you to step in where I was expecting Bill to say something Red Sox related, but right. this point of view there, he's more worried about his hair these days. So Hollywood. <laughs> well, he's, he's a sex symbol. You got to understand that, you know? And also the Red Sox are going to win 20 of 60 games. So I'm not real excited. <laughs> about the baseball season. Sorry. Well, well, he's stealing signs. That's the question. This, this was definitely the right year for Syndergaard to blow out his arm, though. He's not going to miss that many games. So as a Mets fan, that's, that's something to shoot for. And Mike Rapoli is going to buy the Mets, right? That uh, is a big about deal. That. Yes. that is a very big deal. That's Mike by the Mets or Mike by part of the Mets. It's pretty exciting stuff, John. Yeah, no, that, that, that will be very, very exciting. To, to see the general that. manager, Todd Pletcher. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Enough baseball. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. A reminder that wagering through Keeneland Select supports Keeneland's efforts to give back to the thoroughbred industry as profits are reinvested back into the sport through purses, fan development, player rewards, and more. Sign up at www.keenelandselect.com. So we'll start this week with the Belmont, uh, kind of a big race, kind of a race we were all waiting for for a long time, first leg of the Triple Crown. Uh, I thought it was a very fitting ending. Um, I said this on my uh, television appearance that John so kindly brought up before. Um, it was really a, a storybook ending for me just because of the New York Red thing. First New York Red in 138 years to win the Belmont. Uh, it was a nice little completion for Barkley Tag and, and Sacatoga Stable. Obviously winning the 2003 Derby and Preakness with Funny Side. They kind of got their, uh, their triple crown 17 years later. Um, I think it was really heartbreaking for a lot of people when Funny Side lost to Belmont, me included. So that was great. That was really poetic and kind of a fairy tale finish. Um, as far as the race goes, I thought, you know, he looked like a legitimate four to five shot of paper. He was always traveling well, um, always seemed to have a lot of horse. Uh, Manny Franco was looking around at the top of the stretch. I kind of hate when jockeys do that, but in this case, he was warranted. Um, so shout out to, to Manny, shout out to Barkley and, and, and Jack Knowlton and all those guys, a well-deserved win. Um, dominant performance, I think, you know, things will get harder as we go along towards the Derby. I think more new shooters will come around, horses will develop, maybe draw a little bit closer to him in terms of development. But right now, you have to say that he is the head of the class by a good margin. And, you know, Charlatan's on the bench. Al's retired. Wells Bayou, my second pick, went to the shelf as well. Um, so I think he's, he's clearly head and shoulders above everybody else. There's still a lot of time. But I also appreciate that they're going to go to the Travers next. That's a big deal. Um, I worry a little bit about the Travers getting a, a short field with it being only four weeks away from the Derby. But at least you'll have the big horse there. Um, so let's just get your initial takeaways on the Belmont. Bill, you tried to put the kibosh on me with Tis the Law, and he was just too good. Again, the uh, 2020 uh, fantasy draft for three-year-olds of the TDN Writers Room was over the minute you said, with the first pick, I will take Tis the Law. And it is over. Congratulations. But uh, And I'm not trying to put the kibosh on you. I mean, I, that's my respect to Tis the Law, how I think that he sits among this three-year-old class. And you know, the funny thing about it is, normally in a triple crown year, whether it's the Belmont's first or, or whatever, 
you know, you from the first leg, you learn something, you know, that's where everything is sorted out. Really, nothing was sorted out whatsoever in that we knew he had a very good horse. We knew he was better. or Most people knew that he was better than the competition he would face in the Belmont. And the only thing that we might have found out was that we were wrong. And, and we weren't. I mean, it was a really kind of, um, I don't know, I, I'm trying to look for the right word. It was kind of mundane, I guess, in that, you know, what happened on the racetrack was very predictable. And now we move on. I mean, maybe we'll save this discussion for later as we'll get Alan and, and John's thoughts about the race first. But, you know, now what's going to happen if he wins the Derby and then goes into the Freakness with everybody saying, is it or is it not a valid triple crown? Um, you know, maybe that's something to discuss. And I have my feelings about that. So I uh, move over to uh, and, and give the Florida, Mr. Green. Yeah, not really much to add. I mean, you know, we all said last week that Tizzle was the horse to beat. Everyone else was going to be satelliting behind him, um, you know, for second and, and hoping to pick up some, some points. Um, we've talked about how this year's Belmont, unlike other years, you know, aside from the distance being uh, different and the date being different, it's the fact that it's, it's pre-derby, um, which is, is really kind of a, a little unnerving when you look at the calendar and you say, okay, it's June, it's Belmont time. And then you realize we still have two out of the three triple crown races ahead of us. Um, the only thing that really surprised me about the race was, was not that Tis the law had it well in hand and, and that he, you know, won it impressively and looks like he's going to have a shot at, at the newly minted quad, <clears throat> excuse me, quad crown. Um, but the fact that his race, his finish time for the mile was the second fastest mile of the day. And I know we'll get into the other races later on, but, I really want to talk about Kameen and, and, the, and just the race that she put in in, in the grade one acorn. Um, you know, it was secretariat S. Um, and I, I know I'm, I'm kind of going into a race that, uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later on. But first, I want to commend that horse on, on just the absolute phenomenal race that she ran. She finished uh, her mile time was 132 and two was two full seconds faster than the Belmont uh, mile, which is astonishing to me. Um, and we'll get into the merits of her and whether or not she should even have run in the acorn later on. But um, kudos to, to those two horses for just blowing away the competition in grade one races in the top of their class. Yeah, not much to um, to add, really. I thought, you know, a lot of times races don't pan out the way that they map out. And this time it, it did for sure. And I think I said this last week, the addition of four left had some material impact on the race, particularly uh, the performance of Tappet to win. He was always going to get pressure from four left, who was always going to struggle with that, with that trip. Tizzle was going to park outside them three wide, sit in the clear without any trouble ahead and kick in. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. Dr. Post ran, ran on well. Uh, Max Plerke made a nice run from behind and pneumatic. Now, to our good friend Brian DiDonato, he had the second, third, and fourth in his stable. That's pretty. That's pretty good, uh, heady stuff there, Brian. So, so good, uh, good job there. Still chasing. Uh, I don't know what the point standings are now. Well, he's ahead of me. He got on our AP oh, too. Right, right, right. Okay. But um, hey, good job for both of you. You guys are links ahead of us, and uh, I'm still waiting for attachment rate to show up. <laughs> Real shrewd move by me picking Tizzle up first. Really had to dig, dig for that one. Um, <laughs> you could have screwed yeah, the pooch. Ryan, a, lot people, Ryan, a lot of people's number one picks have screwed the pooch before. You you nailed it. Right. It wasn't it wasn't Kajana Carter or, or something like that. <laughs> um, Damn Sam Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but he's so he's kind of blown as well because he's got all he all four of his horses ran already. Now one of mine is injured, but I only have one horse run so far. So I'm I'm hopeful that I'll be over, able to overtake him. But yeah, just one more thing about Tizzle that I, I mentioned after the Florida Derby, which I thought was kind of a, a breakout performance for him because he was able to push the pace on his own. He didn't have, he didn't rely on that kind of one run trip where he just has horses in front of him and then, you know, loops them. He pressed the pace three wide and that kind of was to me, the light bulb moment for him is that he doesn't need a setup. He can make the pace. He can, he can press the pace on his own merits and his own speed. And I thought that was you know, pretty, pretty much the exact same trip that he got in the, in the Belmont. And I think, you know, that's super valuable to have that tactical speed. And I think he's, he's only going to get better. I think he's still a little green. Like I said, after the Florida Derby, I, I would wonder if, if they would ever put blinkers on him. Obviously you don't want to change anything with how well things are going, but he still gets to looking around a little bit. He still, you know, acts a little bit green, but 
that's a pretty good problem to have when you're ahead like five lengths in the stretch of the Belmont and your horse is looking around. A bit. So, you know, obviously not something that Barkley, I, I think, is overly worried about. We'll go through the rest of the card. We're going to talk to Tom Amos, Amos in a little bit. Um, no parole. Uh, going seven furlongs in the Woody Stevens. Good front running ride by uh, Luis Saez. You know, good performance there. Uh, Decorate Invader, I thought that was kind of a breakthrough effort for him, even though figure wise, I think it was pretty similar. Him being able to have that kind of tis the law pace pressing trip, whereas he used to be a deep one run closer. So that was that was a big deal. Good second in the race to uh, by proven strategies. Um, and the Jiper, you know, Al- Al- Alexandra. Love seeing the the females beat up on the boys. That's always always fun. Always good for competition. She's punched her ticket to the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. Nice deep closer. Another great ride by Joel Rosario. And like John said, the star of the weekend. I think the star of the weekend overall was Tis the Law, just because of how big of a deal the Belmont is. But the star of the weekend for racing insiders is Gummy, and that was just an absolutely mind blowing performance because you know it's not like she was ahead by ten lengths on the turn. She was only ahead by a couple lengths at the top of the stretch. And for her to keep widening like that in the stretch was just pretty mind boggling. And to run a 45 and change half and still come home in 47 and change, they don't run 132 miles at Belmont all that often. Now maybe the track was a little bit faster than it normally is, but that was, that was a standout performance. I was a little surprised that the buyer was only 110. I thought it would be a little bit higher than that. I think maybe the the also rands will prove that it's a little bit low in the future when they come back to run. I saw on the thoroughgraph figure she got a negative three and a quarter, which is a huge, huge number for a three-year-old filly, especially this early in the season. Um, I was a little skeptical of her, honestly, going into the race. I thought her reputation was a little bigger than her accomplishments. I thought her debut win was okay. It wasn't... It didn't blow my mind, but it was it was good. And then she had the two-turn win at Oakland, where she really had to dig in to fight off speech to Mike McCarthy horse. And like I said, on the thoroughgraph, she had only gotten fives in her first two races, which is, it's okay. It's not great. And for her to jump up like that was just pretty outstanding. And I wonder if it makes, I know he's pointing to the Oaks. He's thinking about the Preakness, but for her to turn back to that one turn mile and have that kind of a really breakout performance. I wonder if she's going to be a little better going one turn in the future. Obviously, we'll get to see her in the Oaks and see what she can do if she can stay healthy. Maybe she'll run in the test before then, but I think maybe her future is in those one-turn races because that was just – and she's a young horse, so she could develop and and get better at two turns too, but that was so much better than her first two races that it's just – it makes me wonder what her best game is going to be going forward. Other thoughts on the Belmont undercard, guys? Yeah, I mean, I'll pick up on Gamine, and I think you made a good point. I mean, I think about the only thing that might stand between her and, you know, Hall of Fame, super, super, superstardom is just what you said. You know, if you put her right now in a mile eighth Kentucky Oaks, you might make a case that that's not the best fit for her, that she would be dynamite in the one turn miles, the seven furlong test. But but that's, you know, that's kind of nitpicking. And let's not get away from what you said, Joe. I mean, not only was it the best performance of the day and, you know, Maybe I'm forgetting something here or there. It might have been the best performance by a racehorse we've seen in the last 10 years. I mean, I mean, that is as big a statement as that sounds. I mean, somebody please come up with something, you know, better than that. And I'm with you. The hundred arrogate. 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 Yeah, all right. Best performance by a Philly in the last 10 years. Okay, how about that? Mm-hmm. Um, all right, all right. We'll it, it was it. that it was that good. So it'll be fascinating now to see what they really want to do. And you know, like uh, but even if the, the ownership group and Baffert thinks that, you know, maybe she's better at one turn or the race like the test would just be right up her uh, alley. I don't think they're going to go in that direction because there's nothing sexy about that. You know, you want to win the Kentucky Oaks and, you know, maybe you flirt with the idea of going in a triple crown race. And, uh, you know, I'm doing the Kentucky Oaks top 10. I thought there's no way Swiss Skydiver ever gets knocked off the top. I mean, what is she doing wrong? I have to put her to uh, give me number one right now. Um, you know, it was, it was, you, you were, I think you were used the word mind blowing. Uh, I mean, phenomenal, extraordinary, uh, you know, once in a decade type thing, use whatever, um, you know, uh, accolade you want, they all fit. Yeah. And, and, and mind blowing is, is a great adjective for her as well as for the situation for her, obviously, because again, she ran so fast and so dominant, um, and finished up so strongly that you just had to take, you know, notice and, and just, it was awe inspiring. 
Um, I don't even really remember watching the, uh, the, the Jiper, to be honest with you, because I just I kept rewinding the finish of the acorn um, on TV just to watch it over and over again, just to make sure that like my eyes weren't deceiving me. Um, so again, phenomenal, phenomenal, uh, race, phenomenal Philly, obviously she cost well over a million dollars. So they thought that, that she, you know, has the looks as well as the talent and into mischief. The question was, you know, if, if her damn, uh, Peggy Jane, if she was, you know, mayor number one forty one this year or, or next year with, with the, you know, with the proposed cap, which she have even, you know, produced Gamine, that's for another story. It's for another, another show. Um, but the other reason why I would use mind blowing with regard to this race and this Philly is it is mind blowing to me that we still don't have the test results back from the split sample. Um, because let's not forget that she has a failed test that's sitting out there right now, kind of, you know, in, in no man's land. Um, and we're still waiting for the split sample. Tell me how long does it take to get a split sample done? Or is this a situation where they're kind of like pushing it off and sweeping it under the rug? like other you know, tests have been, not just for Baffert, but for other big trainers in the industry. So I, I, don't want to, I don't want to taint her performance, but let's call a spade a spade. She's got a tainted test right now. Um, all, you know, all hail to Gamine. She did what she had to do. I would call it Rachel Alexandra-esque before I would call it secretary-esque. But um, I always got the feeling that Rachel did that between the oaks and the um, and the mother goose, the way she won those races was so devastating in hand on the bridle. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what what becomes of her. It certainly would be interesting to run in the seven furlong Longine test and then stretch back out to nine furlongs four weeks later for the Oaks. That would be a pretty, pretty cool accomplishment. It may be a runner in the Met Mile. Just just kidding. Um, the run happy uh, met mile, isn't it? Sorry, the run happy. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank um, <laughs> but other than that, um, I thought no parole was good in, in the uh, Woody Stevens. Um, I did not see him getting loose that way. I thought Echo Town would be much more prominent than, than he was. And I don't think I saw the half mile going up at anything more than 45 seconds. I think it was 45.01. Um, and from there, it was, was just kind of all over. But nice to see a Louisiana bred break through grade one level. Uh, Tom Amos will talk to you about this. And uh, had another grade one winner, Louisiana bred for Maggie Moss, uh, called Big World in La Trienne a few years ago. So, uh, so good for them. And, um, yeah, just good to, good to have a day of Triple Crown Racing. Nice to, you know, nice to have a big day, you know, fans or not. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we've said this before on the podcast, but you got to do a big hats off to Naira and everybody at Naira for being able to get back to that point where they can have that big day that we can all mark on our and circle on our calendar. Um, so that in the, grand, in the grand scheme of things is a, is a big deal for the sport, big deal for New York, big deal for racing. Uh, John, it's a good point about Gamin's test. I hadn't really thought about that, but, you know, you got to, you, you have to consider that. You have to, you have to consider whether or not, that test is ever going to come out to the public or at least come out in a, in a time frame where it matters to anybody. Um, so that's, that's definitely a good point. And, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be remiss and not mention those things because we like, you know, we like to talk about the, the, the dark side of the game too, as well as, as the bright side. So obviously an incredible performance, but you're right that it does, it does leave a little bit of a question mark over her career until that thing is settled. I think that's definitely right. Well, I guess the other big story out of the Belmont, as I touched upon earlier, is, you know, how is this going to be treated by historians? And um, if Tis the Law uh, fades away and doesn't win the Kentucky Derby, it's probably going to be something that that really is is not discussed. But we all have to prepare ourselves for the dreaded asterisk. Uh, and what is going to, you know, what they did to Roger Maris is, is Tis the Law going to be the Roger Maris of uh, horse racing? And does he or does he not deserve to be considered a legitimate Triple Crown winner? I, I know, look, I mean, for him to win the Triple Crown is still, you know, huge if with both the, the um, Kentucky Derby and the Preakness and also with him starting in the Travers in between. My opinion is that he would be deserving. And I, I don't think different is worse 
different is different. And whether or not it's easier or harder, nobody really knows. I mean, you can make a case, you can debate both sides of it. I think personally, if anyone, if he were to win the Triple Crown, everyone would say, oh, no, he doesn't belong with the other 13. It's it's tainted because of, of all the things we've talked about, the Belmont a mile and eight, Belmont first, the uh, Kentucky Derby second. Um, I think that would be unfair to this horse myself. I really do. Now, will he win the Triple Crown? Probably not. As good as he is, it's still an inc- incredibly difficult thing to do. And I, I think you can even make a case that doing it over 15 weeks is harder than over five weeks. Because yes, five weeks is hard on the modern horse, but you only have to stay good for five weeks. This way, you have to stay good for 15. And look, look how hard that is. Look at Nadal, Charlotte, and all these horses that have fallen by the wayside. You got to stay good for 15 weeks. You're going to have to fight off a, a new wave of new shooters coming at you at the Derby, et cetera. It's not going to be easy. I vote that he would be deserving. I agree. And I've kind of gone back and forth in my mind about this. Um, I think a lot of a lot of, you know, racing purists will probably put an asterisk on these races no matter what. But I think it's true that, you know, the hardest thing about the Triple Crown in its regular form is five, three weeks, five races. And that is difficult. But if you think about and especially if the horse is very impressive in the Kentucky Derby and then the Preakness, it's kind of like a war of attrition. And these horses drop away from the from the Triple Crown Trail. They start pointing towards summer races, start getting fresh for the summer and fall. So a lot of times you face a much weaker field in the Preakness than you did in the Derby, and then an even weaker field in the Belmont than you did in the Preakness. So while it is difficult in terms of the turnaround, I think the competition level in the Triple Crown is not usually what it is or what it's going to be this year. Because with the Derby, you know, everybody and their mother is spending all summer pointing to the Derby. It's a different thing than, you know, earlier in the year when it's, it's in May and a horse, you know, stubs a toe in, in February or March and now they're gone. And they, they're, not, they're no longer a Derby contender. This time, you know, if you have an early injury, an early setback, you have the luxury. And I think a lot of horses are taking advantage of, of this of getting that whole spring and summer to prepare for the Derby. So I think it's going to be an even better field than it would normally in terms of, you know, horses that are able to recover from early injuries. And in terms of development, these are going to be older, you know, more mentally and physically developed horses. I think the Preakness will be interesting to see what kind of field that gets because it is between the Derby and the Breeders' Cup. I think a lot of people are going to be, you know, cautious and, and, and want the full six or eight weeks or whatever it is to the Breeders' Cup. So I think, you know, that's that's a factor. But I agree with you, Bill, that overall this, in a way, is a more challenging proposal, especially if he runs in the Travers. Listen, if he wins the Travers and then wins the other two, I don't want to hear anything about an asterisk. If he wins all four of those races, that's going to be a feat that I think few horses in history, or in at least modern history, will have been equal to. So I agree that I, th- I think in a way it's more difficult and it'll be even more impressive if he's able to stay together, take on all those new shooters, take on all those developed horses and still get it done. Yeah, I think this is a situation where we're going to agree to disagree. Um, to me, the, the feat of the Triple Crown isn't just winning the races, because obviously that's a huge part of the accomplishment. It's doing it in the time frame um, that's that's allowed. So it's doing it in the three Grade one race is a triple crown in a five week window at three different racetracks. If you look at claiming horses that have to run, you know, on back to back races, you guys are all handicappers. You kind of go, all right, well, the horse just peaked and won at at uh, at Foner, and now I'm bringing it to Monmouth. Uh, I don't know. The ship is going to be too tough. It's a too quick of a turnaround. Um, you know, there's new horses coming in. It's difficult for claiming horses. I mean, even So Volante, who just won an impressive allowance race down in Florida. 10 days later, you know, they, they shipped him up from Gulfstream to Belmont and he ran a very lackluster race in, in the, in the, uh, in the Belmont stakes. So to me, it, it's not just the accomplishment of finishing first in all three of these races. It's doing it in such a small window of period of time, um, regardless of who the shooters are. It's only happened a few times. So to me, you know, all of 2020 is going to have an asterisk next to it, no matter, you know, regardless of what the results are. Um, but it, it, you have to look at it and say, was it impressive he won all three races or if he wins the Travers also all four races? Absolutely. That's huge. And I would breed a mare to him at least, um, you know, with the hopes of trying to replicate his talent. But in my own personal mind, it does is there an asterisk for, for winning it over a 15 or 16 week window? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I have to agree um, with John. Um, 
to think about American Pharaoh or even justify even more so given what, what he accomplished. But even going back to horses like Funny Side and um, horses that won two legs and, and, and weren't able to seal the deal, it's just that's the demands of the Triple Crown. Now, if he were to win the Derby and the Preakness in addition to, to the Belmont, you, you tip your cap to him. I don't think it impacts his value going forward. Um, any farm is going to be happy to, to stand him. Farm's going to be happy to stand him right now based on what he's done to date. So it, it is a, a feat to keep these horses going for, um, heck, for four weeks at a time, let alone 15 weeks. So if he does it, you tip your cap. I don't think he can be considered um, in the same discussion as a pharaoh or justify just given the circumstances. But that doesn't really d d detract from, from what he accomplishes. Can I jump in and say I have a major issue with what John Green said? He knocked Foner Park. Damn it, John, no. <laughs> I'm, That's sacrilege. Buddy. I'm sorry, Bill. <laughs> that, is, that is sacrilege. I should know better. <laughs> what By the way, Foner Park. I went around eight times. Right, yeah. <laughs> Joe Bianca has called Tis the Law I, on air. He's called Tis, Tis the Law Triple Crown winner. So no one could remember that. So why that not? was definitely definitely bold. So really, no no rest for the weary after that big weekend of racing. We have another big weekend coming up, mainly at Churchill Downs this week. Um, just want to set the scene a little bit. We got the the Stephen Foster, the Regret, the Florida Lee, the Bashford Manor, all at Churchill Downs. Big card at Belmont as well. We got the Justa game the New York, the true North and the vagrancy. Um, also the Ohio Derby, not to, not to leave them out big overflow field for the Ohio Derby. Uh, this is kind of what we were talking about earlier in the year about how these three-year-old races, you know, everybody's going to be wanting to get in and, and elbowing each other out of the way to try to get some of these lesser three-year-old per or stakes under their belt um, to, you know, have their stepping stones to the Derby. Um, also this weekend, the Irish Derby, don't want to leave out the, the European, Aspect here, the uh, Takarazuka Kinen. Did I do that right, Al? On yeah, Sunday yeah. in Japan. Um, so yeah, great action all around. To me, the big uh, I, this is isn't going out on a limb, but the big story of of the weekend is going to be in the Fort Lee Midnight Bizu's first race since running second in the Saudi Cup. Uh, we thought we might get a matchup of her and Mono White Girl, which would be the first time they've clashed since their three-year-old season, but it looks like Bill reported yesterday that Mono White Girl is going to be pointing to the ruffian at Belmont. A little bit of, a little bit disappointing there, but, you know, she's she's been off a long time, so I can understand. I don't want to get John started. Wait, I heard Mon Mono White Girl is back? She's back? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we'll see. We'll see if there's another ad run after. after <laughs> <laughs> if I were them, I would run one just to piss you off after that whole thing. I would it's got no you. effect. Believe me, they can get in line with people that are trying to piss me off. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so, I mean, she's, she's she was off a long time, so I, I kind of get um, wanting to keep her, her shorter for now. But that was that was a little bit disappointing. Uh, Midnight Bizu, you got to think is going to be a big favorite. Serengeti Empress uh, seems to be the main challenger to her. Um, just looking through some of these other fields in the Bashford Manor, we've got uh, Rising Star and Casadero for Stone Street and Ashmussen. Interested to see how she runs. Um, big field for the Regret as well, including possibly. Harvey's Little Goyle, another favorite of the show. Um, the Vagrancy, okay field. Uh, Come Dancing might make a return there. True North has a big field, it looks like. Um, Stephen Foster, Tom's Data, first race as, I believe, a seven-year-old now? Or did he run he the race? No, he ran it uh, at Oaklawn in that Oaklawn mile against uh, that's, right. that's right. Okay, so second race is a seven-year-old, but... Got his big win last year, last year in the Clark at Churchill. So he's coming back home for that race. He's going to go up against By My Standards, who's an up and coming, you know, handicapped division horse. A couple other interesting horses in there. In the uh, in the Justa game, newspaper of record prop possible, but it would be it'd be a short turnaround. Uni, we might see her return in there. So that's a really interesting field. Um, also have uh, rushing fall, significant form for Chad Brown. Probably Chad's going to have three or four horses in there. Um, got stormy might run. I don't, I, I just feel like she's not quite the same horse as she was last year. I just think her, her races this year have left a lot to be desired. She really had no punch at all in the bogey. 
Um, so overall, Midnight Bijou is definitely the headliner, but a lot of stakes action, action to look forward to. A lot of big horses running this weekend. Just wonder if you guys have any thoughts on what you're looking forward to the most. Well, I guess, I'll, like you said, I probably were looking forward mostly to the Florida Lee at Churchill Downs uh, because, you know, first of all, Midnight Bijou, who may be the Saudi Cup winner. But what do we think is going to happen first? Word out of Saudi Arabia where their maximum security is going to be taken down or word out of Arkansas about the positives from the Arkansas Derby Day. We want to have another fantasy contest on on, on that. <laughs> um, but you would think, you know, Midnight Bisu, what, with what she did last year and how well she ran in the Saudi Cup would be, you know, one to a thousand when she came back and, and ran in, uh, you know, it's just sort of an ordinary, otherwise ordinary race in the U.S. But Serengeti Empress is, is a fascinating horse. And if she can get loose on the lead, she's fantastic. If she can't, she just doesn't run well at all. It definitely looks like she's going to get loose on the lead in there. And, you know, is Midnight Bisu good enough to run her down? Um, you know, I'll have to give that some further thought as I handicap the race. And I do want to, I wish we could rewind and play uh, on the show back, I don't know, maybe in February. I got roasted because I had Harvey's little girl at like eighth in my Kentucky Oaks and I didn't have her like second or something. I mean, basically the people call me an idiot, a nitwit. You have no idea what you're doing. Now, how do those people feel now that she's embarking on a grass career after losing by 22 lengths in the fantasy in her last start? So I am <laughs> definitely owed some apologies by, uh, the people who shall remain nameless that yeah. that was Brian. I'll name I know Brian. Was Brian. I wish Brian. you would show. <laughs> yeah. I know it's Brian. I wish he was on the show, but I can't Bill, beat up on him because he's not Bill, here. Bill, I've, I've called you an idiot for other reasons. So I, I can't apologize for Harvey's right. little girl. You know, and I wish Harvey's little girl, maybe she'll wind up winning the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Turf. And then everybody can say, see, we knew how good Harvey's little girl was. And of course, Tom's to tot in, in the uh, Stephen Foster will, will, will be good. I mean, it's just so neat that he's, I wish they'd run him more, but I wish that about all horses. But it's neat that a seven year old. Uh, non gelding is, you know, having this renaissance in his career and is a favorite in a grade one race on Saturday and uh, looks to be pretty strong in there. Grade two now. It is a grade two. Okay. How about that? All right. Yeah. Correct me. I, I just love the fact that starting last week that the floodgates have opened and that we have all these phenomenal race cards going deep fields, great horses coming back um, grade three, grade two, grade ones, and horses, you know, rising to the occasion. Um, like we just talked about all the big winners over, over the weekend from, uh, you know, from decorated uh, uh, um, invader, excuse me, to no parole to obviously, you know, the other horses that won the great ones that we've talked about at nauseum. Um, but it's just so exciting to turn on, you know, the, the, the TV or, or watch races or open the racing form and look at the forms of all of these fantastic horses. They're all coming back. They're all fresh. They've all got a, you know, they're all sharp and they're all pointing for the same races. I mean, this is, this is exciting. This is why we get into the business um, is for races like this weekend cards like this. And for us to have debates over, you know, was it, you know, secretariat esque or Rachel Alexander esque? It's just nice to have some racing esque going on. So uh, I'm, I'm just excited for all the reasons you guys mentioned. Um, I guess I'm looking forward most to the Stephen Foster. I'll, I'll be on a beach somewhere Saturday afternoon, four o'clock. Um, by my standards, Tom Stata and Owendale from outside. Owendale is interesting to me because I thought he was impressive enough winning the blame stakes going the one turn mile that they might consider the run happy met for him. And it just makes total sense to me. I'm not in, in business of telling people how to manage their horses, but um, with a couple of grade one opportunities going forward, Whitney, um, for example, you've got opportunities to stretch back out. If you take a crack at a grade one mile, which is obviously a stallion making race, um, you've got chance to, to regroup afterwards. So I was a bit surprised that, that they didn't take a look at that impressive as he was in, uh, in winning the blame stakes, but he's equally capable at mile and an eighth and, and that, uh, that certainly figures to be a pretty interesting threesome in that race. We're all in the business of telling people how to run their horses. It just, it's just part of the game, you know? Just it's a matter of when the they start listening. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of the game of being a talking head. It's in the contract. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland.
building a multiple grade stakes winning race where it's like hard not to love and also decorated in Vader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs on one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. Big weekend for West Point Thoroughbreds. Um, they were all they were waiting for a lot of their big horses to come back, and they did in a big way. Uh, Decorate Invader, we, we touched on earlier, a big, big win. He's got to be considered the leader in the three-year-old turf division at this moment. Um, it'd be interesting to see if he, stretch, if he stretches out to a mile and an eighth, mile and a quarter or later in the year, but he certainly is, is a beast and a terror at a mile. And also, we didn't mention, but I wanted to give a shout out to Kanthaka and Graham Motion. What an incredible training job that was to have – him ready off of a year plus layoff. It was the first start for Graham Motion, and he looked like a winner until deep stretch. And then you know Joel Rosario always seems to get those horses up in turf sprints, and Alexandra just ran him down. But that was a really he, he was closer to a fast pace than Alexandra was, and you could argue that he ran a winning race. So he's an interesting horse. You know, going forward, he's got options. He's proven on the dirt. Um, you know, it's turf sprint, dirt sprint, seven furlongs to a mile. So he's, he's a sleeper, I think, going forward in grade one races on both services. Um, so big shout out to West Point. It was good to see those those silks blazing past the wire and, and with the in the Penine Ridge, Bill's favorite race. And, you know, Ken Thuck, I think it should not be overlooked as well. So congrats, guys. We're happy for you. And uh, can't wait to see what the summer brings for the rest of those horses. So there's some news this week in terms of what racing is going to look like regarding the rest of the fall or, rest of the, or the rest of the summer and the fall, um, whether or not we're going to see fans in the stands. I, I, one of the images that really stuck with me from Belmont Stakes Day is NBC had a big wide shot. Maybe it was from a drone or something of Gameen just running alone through the stretch and between her being alone from the rest of the horses and no fans in the stands. It looked like just one horse galloping in the morning, had the track completely to herself. I thought it was a really powerful image, but that might change. And it, there was news last week, we didn't get to it, that Delaware Park is going to start allowing fans. There's more news this week that Monmouth, which opens next week, is going to start allowing some fans. I believe the attendance will be capped at 15,000. Um, and then it came out yesterday that Monmouth is going to allow owners to come and watch weekend workouts as well. It also broke yesterday that Churchill Downs is putting in a proposal to have fans at the Derby in September. Um, it's unclear at this point whether or not that means full capacity or limited capacity. Um, but I think this is this is a promising sign for the sport. I think in most instances, there's not going to be a ton of fans where there wasn't before. You know, on a random Wednesday or a Thursday in most of these tracks, you might get a couple hundred, maybe a thousand or two. But for these big races, I think it's gonna it, it'll really add to the to the ambiance and the 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 I don't know what the word is like the the atmosphere I guess of the sport and of the races. So um, Bill did some reporting on this. Do you think what do you, if you had to handicap? Do you think we're gonna see fans at the Derby? And if so, how many? Well, I think that we are definitely gonna see fans at the Derby. But I'm gonna I'm gonna temper that. Uh, I'll say I think. Let me start all over again. I think that we are likely to see fans at the Derby. And I think that the right now, the uh, idea that's being put forth to have fans at the Derby by Churchill Downs submitted to Governor Bashir in Kentucky, uh, I think it's all but certain that he's going to say yes. Now, a couple ifs, though. First of all, think back of the again, we, we, we laugh about how we talk about baseball, but Two, three weeks ago, everybody's saying that spring training was going to resume in Arizona and Florida. Now, Arizona and Florida, Florida particularly, are the two of the hottest spots for the coronavirus in the entire country. And now nobody can go down there and have spring training. That shows you how much these things change. So if they make a decision in late June, what factors are going to be in play in, in, in early September? You just you can't predict the future. This thing is so unpredictable. Having said that, it's clear that they're going to have uh, approval from the government to have fans in the stands. The question is, does that mean 150,000 people like a traditional derby with, you know, people packed in the infield and everybody packed, you know, six, you know, six feet apart. They're not going to be six inches apart at the derby. I, this is just my guess that they're probably going to reach some sort of compromise um, where they can have a smaller crowd, uh, have social distancing, et cetera. But the good news is we're not going to have to wait too long for this. Um, the Governor Bashir said in this press conference on Monday that he'll have an announcement on this shortly. Matter of fact, that everybody thinks it's going to happen sometime this week. But I, I would 
uh, preface that again or caution everybody what is said in june doesn't necessarily mean it's going to hold up in september yeah joe to use your term it's topsy-turvy i mean who knows it, it, it's a fluid situation so who knows you know what rules are going to be implemented now or suggested now that may be implemented in september or october um i'm really excited about obviously our regional racetracks um, allowing fans and, and owners to come in um, Delaware Park, you mentioned, they they uh, they allowed people last week. Monmouth Park is allowing people, um, you know, as of as of opening weekend. I thought it was very shrewd um, by the management of Monmouth Park when they did their calculation. Um, the question from the state was, what is capacity at at at, at your venue? And the answer is sixty thousand because that's how many people they could max out, um, you know, for fire and health codes for the Haskell. So it's a simple mathematical equation. You divide that by, by or you multiply that times 25%, and that's the amount of people that are allowed to come to Monmouth Park. Now, that being said, I think other than Haskell, that you can add up the, the number of people that come up, you know, come in every weekend at Monmouth Park, and it may eclipse 15,000 in, you know, in, in total. Um, so I think that, that Monmouth is in a really good position where they're going to be able to allow people to come in, bet on uh, what's going on on the track as well as in the sports book, which again is really the reason why they want to have so many people come to the track. Um, and most importantly, the fans can watch their, their horses run and even go into the paddock and maybe even the winter circle, um, depending on what the final rulings are. So I'm very excited for local racing to start up again um, and for a reason to, uh, to get out of the house and, and ultimately, you know, watch our horses uh, campaign on, on at the uh, local racetracks. And to piggyback off Bill a little bit, um, I think the Kentucky, the decision from Governor Bashir will be particularly of interest going forward uh, in terms of Breeders' Cup and, and what happens with that. I guess it hasn't been specifically mentioned as part of this discussion, but um, certainly, and again, a lot can change, but certainly what happens now will be of interest to, to September. I'm kind of curious about track attendance that having been deprived of the opportunity to, to attend races live, understanding that's not people's motivation these days, but I wonder if there's not going to be a short term uptick in on track attendance in places like um, Belmont and Monmouth. Um, it looked like I, I didn't see a, a full shot, but the line to get into Delaware Park last Wednesday was long enough. Um, I just wonder if people might, take that opportunity given that it's been, you know, six months, nine months since they've been able to go watch a live horse race. I think, you know, that definitely could be a factor. I think that on the, on the flip side of that, you know, if you look at polling, I think it's, it's kind of underreported that people are worried. People are, I think are a lot more concerned that, you know, restrictions are going to be lifted too early rather than too late. So I think there's there's that part of it, too, that, that people are a little wary of, of gathering in, in groups like that. I don't think that there's any way it makes sense to have 150,000 people at the Derby in September. It's just, you know, there's no vaccine yet. Yeah, like a lot of states are in better places than they were earlier in the year, including New York and New Jersey. But a lot of states are still now, you know, seeing the highest caseload they've ever seen like Texas and Florida and Arizona and a lot of places in the South. And I talked about this earlier in the year that it's going to be a lot of starts and stops because there are these other states that aren't taking it as seriously, you know, and I understand it. I understand that if it's not in front of you on a day-to-day -day basis, you're like, well, what's, what's this all about? I'm going to live my life here in New York. You know, we had no choice, you know, New York and New Jersey, we were like, you know, faced with it on a daily basis. So we, we really had no choice, but to, you know, abide by all the regulations and the restrictions and all that. But these other states in the South mainly that didn't take it as seriously, they're in a bad position now. And there's not too many racetracks. I guess, you know, in Florida, you got Gulfstream and Tampa. They've been able to manage to stay open this whole time. So hopefully they'll, they'll continue to do that. But, you know, just back to my original point, you just there's no way that it seems like it'll be a good idea or, or it'll be, you know, in the interest of public health mm -hmm. to have so many people in the Derby uh, as they would normally. I just, you know, I think when the, when the decision comes out, it'll be similar to what we had at Monmouth where it's like 25% capacity, but it's just, you got to, you know, I miss fans too. I would love to hear the roar of the crowd again, but you know, there's, there are bigger issues here and there's, there's bigger concerns. And I just, 
I worry about, you know, tracks and, and, and places opening too quickly. And, you know, we're kind of back where we started a little bit. Um, so hopefully they, they do the responsible thing. I think Andy Bashir has done a good job so far. I think most governors have been pretty cautious, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what they come out with, but you know, it's definitely encouraging, definitely encouraging for the sport and definitely encouraging for the horsemen also who get to be back on track and the owners. And, uh, we look forward to that. Hey, Joe, quickly, I want to make one more point on this because it was brought up so much. I, I kind of want for the record people to know that they're it's talking about how quickly things can change. Delaware Park has already changed what they're doing. They're only allowing a maximum of a thousand people to attend the races and only 500 inside the stands uh, itself. Another 500 could sit out back. I'm not saying this to be snarky, but I doubt Delaware Park even gets a thousand uh, racing fans a day. But they have made that, except maybe on weekends, they have made that ruling. And also, I totally agree with you if 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 they said more the merrier anyone who wants to come to the kentucky derby um or any other racetrack i don't think that people are going to flock to the through the turnstiles like we normally would because a lot of people are scared to go out and also remember that and not the kentucky derby but horse racing's fans tend to uh, tend to be older um, uh, and to are people who are in more vulnerable areas of uh, so far as contracting the coronavirus. And uh, yeah, I mean, some of these tracks reopen with fans, which I'm glad to see. I think it's great, but I, I don't think they're going to be uh, flocking that. I'll disagree with Alan that I don't think there's going to be any great demand to go whatsoever. I think it's going to be the opposite. So we got our first preview of life as we know it now in the coronavirus era in terms of the sale market, the, the, um, the, the stage that's been set now for the rest of the year in terms of online sales, online bidding, the Keeneland Horses of Racing A sale happened yesterday. Um, there were a good deal of RNAs. I think a lot of people were still getting used to the platform. Uh, I, the main thing that I, I heard that people, I think, had issues with, and this wasn't Keeneland's fault, uh, was the idea of not being able to inspect the horses themselves in person. And that's just a function of the virus. And I think, you know, a lot of people, they, you know, especially horses who have run a lot already and might have some wear and tear. I think it's, you know, you have vet reports and all that, but I don't think it's quite the same as being able to inspect the horse in person. Obviously not an expert in this scenario. John Green was heavily involved in the sale yesterday. So, John, I'll ask you your impressions of, of the, the first day of the brand new world of, of, of racing sales or horse, horse sales. It, it was very interesting. We were involved not only as uh, sellers, but also looking at a couple of horses and kicking tires to be buyers on on a couple of horses. Um, let's go through the, the good and the bad. OK, the, the good thing is congratulations to Keeneland for offering this venue um, of a completely, uh, you know, uh, Internet based platform. Um, it was different. It was weird. It would, took a little time to get used to, to the rules of the game. Um, but once you understood how the actual auction was going to be offered and, and go forward, um, and then you had a significant amount of time, almost the entire day, to decide how much you wanted to bid and, and increase bid bidding, um, that part of the website and the platform was seamless and, and you know very uh, intuitive. Um, we had eight horses in the sale. At the end of the sale, we had four of them sold, um, which we were initially disappointed on. And then over the next three hours from like three o'clock until six o'clock, we were just bombarded by emails, texts, and phone calls, uh, inquiries about the horses that didn't sell. There were RNAs. So I think one of the takeaways from this sale platform is, Joe, just like you said, people want to be able to see and lay hands on these horses, especially ones that have run and have um, you know, a little less tread on the tire. They just wanted to be able to look at them watch them walk, maybe even watch them, you know, jog up and down the street and get an idea of, of what's left on these horses and also how to value them. Um, but the second thing is that the, the sale itself allowed a market to be set. So once the owner put in a reserve and said, and it wasn't just us, I think that there were, uh, if I'm looking at the numbers right, there were like two thirds of the horses that didn't get sold that were RNAs. So that basically set a marketplace for you know, value for those horses. And that's when we started getting all these inquiries on the horses is once people knew, okay, I can buy this horse that you have in the sale, um, the RNA, the RNA for 24,000. So let me start offering 25 or 30 or 35,000. That's really when the second part of the sale started. And I don't think that was the intention of us as sellers or of Keeneland to put together this venue. But that was the result was that at least it brought horses to the marketplace 
and allowed the general public to see that horses were available and then get an idea of what the valuation was as opposed to having to go through you know, four different agents and a trainer to be able to figure out, you know, what the actual value and, and, and amount of a horse that was, you know, willing to be sold. So it gave the, the end game, the takeaway from all this is that Keeneland gave us a platform to sell horses, whether we sold them actually through the auction directly or afterwards is immaterial. You know, we got to sell some horses, get some cash flow in other people got some great racing opportunities and some opportunities to have quick return on investment. Um, so if that was the overall goal of the internet sale, then they achieve those goals. Um, it wasn't as straightforward as normal sales where you put a horse in, it goes to the ring for 30 seconds and you know, at that point in time, whether or not you have a sale or not, it was a little bit more drawn out, but just like the first time we did this podcast, um, we weren't as slick and sharp and as intuitive and, and, and together as, as we are now, um, you know, almost on our 50th show. Some people will say we've improved a lot. Some people will say we haven't improved at all, but that's for another discussion. Um, that, that's, that's, you know, that, that's for another show. But at the end, of the end of the day, I'm glad that Keeneland put together this venue. I was pleased that we were able to accomplish our goals in um, setting values and, and selling most of the horses that we had in the sale. And I think overall, it was a good next step in the evolution of the industry in an industry that doesn't evolve that quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's going it's to be a learning process, I think, throughout the year for everybody. Um, and this was just kind of the, the kickoff to it and was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a dry run um, for the rest of the year. And obviously, the bigger sales coming up in the fall. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I think people will get more used to the platform and more used uh, to the format. And I think it'll only get better from here. But yeah, I mean, it, it, Keeneland had to step out and, and, and do this first. And uh, I, I think overall, it showed the way forward for the sport, at least through the, through the rest of this year. And Jerry, right, the, other, the other quick takeaway that I'll, that I'll say from this is that, you know, whether it was Keeneland or Fazig or, or OBS or, or uh, you know, an in, independent group, it showed me one thing. And that is people still want to gravitate to an actual bricks and mortar sale and go and look at horses. So the internet is a great vehicle for it to, as an addendum, but you know, the, the major sales companies aren't going anywhere. You still need to go and look at the horses and lay hands on them and watch them. Um, so the idea that people had out there where, well, this is gonna put Keeneland and Fasic and OBS out of business is completely off. Um, if anything, it, it reinforced the fact of the need to have an actual bricks and mortar sale and attendance there. John, great insights as always um, on the Keelan sale. And, and it's definitely a, a developing situation we're going to look forward to in the future and especially in the fall with the yearling sales. Um, so this is, this is the way of the world now. And uh, it's good that we had you and a lot of people as a guinea pig to do this. Um, so we're, it's only going to get better and smoother and easier from here. Joining the West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class sources for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. of the week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more on how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group guest of the week this week, trainer of a newly minted grade one winner and a returning grade one winner this Saturday, Tom Amos. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here, Joe. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so we'll talk about first no parole. Congratulations on that win. Um, he's an interesting horse because he's a Louisiana bred, started his career in Louisiana bred company and then, you know, stepped into open company and has obviously proven his mettle. Uh, my question about him is he tried to stretch out in the rebel, didn't run that well, but that was a really fast pace. He won at a mile before turned back has won at seven furlongs. Now, what is the plan for him going forward? Would you think of stretching him back out? And if not, what would be your goals, both short and long-term for him? Well, uh, let's go back in time with no parole to when he first was making his debut at the fairgrounds against state bred competition. Uh, 
I recall vividly calling Maggie Moss and telling her about two weeks before the race, hey, this isn't just a good Louisiana bred sprinter. This is a very good racehorse. Uh, he won that debut by open lengths and then came back against Louisiana Breads again, won again uh, as easy as you wanted. And then, as you said, went two turns at Delta Downs and a stake against Louisiana Breads and won again. So that's what led us to trying the Rebel. So you're at a point at that stage. This is long before the COVID had come along. We're thinking, hey, we've got a very good three-year-old. Are we good enough to stretch it out to two turns and possibly make the Kentucky Derby? A lot of people have horses like that come January, February of their three-year-old year. So we did try the Rebel. It, it, was, a, it was a failed experiment. Uh, and not only was it a failed experiment, but it was right at the time where we took on a partner, uh, Greg Traumatine, who now owns half the horse. And he bought into the horse after a lot of research and studying. And he's from Baton Rouge. And, um, you know, he knew that we were rolling the dice trying two turns. It's my opinion, Joe, that this is not a two-turn horse. Uh, that no parole is much better at one turn, and we're going to stick to that. Short-term goals, he's now a grade one winner. He's undefeated going one turn in four starts. His only blemish is that two-turn race in the Rebel. Uh, so, you know, we're looking uh, to probably take him to Saratoga, continue on that route, and, you know, in the back of our minds, if, if the horse stays healthy and does good, you know, when he gets to the end of his three-year-old year where he'll, his maturity level will catch up to the older horses, the Breeders' Cup sprint's a possibility. So that's a that's a short-term goal and a long-term goal. And, of course, we think he'd make a heck of a stallion. Uh, he's gorgeous, good-looking. He just won an important stallion race. So we've got that in our mind as well. So all those things are kind of in motion right now, I guess is the right way to put it, and we'll see how it plays out. Hey, Tom, thanks for joining us. I'm switching gears to the other big horse that's in the news right now, uh, Serengeti Empress. And we knew the apple blossom coming out of the gate. It wasn't going to work for her the way the race developed. And, you know, she's either or. If she gets loose on the lead, she's a monster. If she doesn't get loose on the lead or gets any pace pressure, she doesn't perform well. It looks on paper in the Florida lead that she's going to get an uncontested lead. I think you probably agree with that, but please talk about that. And if so, is she good enough to beat Midnight Peace, sir? Right. So uh, I'll take that one at a time. So going back to her last race, which was the Apple Blossom, it was a disaster. We drew a terrible post. That was at a time where no one had a place to run their horses. So the field was a hosh bosh of horses. Uh, and right inside of us was not only a speed horse, but a, a horse that doesn't negotiate the turns well. And I knew if we couldn't clear that horse, we were in trouble. And, uh, you know, I did the Fox show that day and I, I, I said it as plain as I could say it. Hey, you know, if we're not on the lead going around that first turn, you know, we're in trouble. So uh, you're right. Um, but she's come back. She's worked really well. Churchill Downs is her track. She's run well here, not only in the Kentucky Oaks, but the year before when she won her first graded stake as a two-year-old. So, you know, all those things lead us to wanting to try this race. I've got tremendous respect for the champion, Midnight Bisu. And, uh, you know, I know it has to be our best day to beat her. But the game plan is simple. You know, to Talamo, I'm simply going to say, make the lead, you know, make the lead no matter what. So, uh, Bill, you mentioned one thing about pace pressure. And remember this about Sarah Getty Empress, and you've witnessed it just as I have. She's got a high cruising speed. So she can take some pace pressure early on. Uh, she's just not going to take the pace pressure for a full half a mile of the horse alongside of her. So, you know, if somebody out of the gate decides they want to try to pressure us a little bit, that's okay. But uh, we need to clear them after, say, the first quarter of a mile. And then that's where Serengeti's heart gets big and she does what she does best. And that's use her speed to try to bury the field. <laughs> that's a big, big statement when you're going against a champion. But, uh, but we'll see what happens. Tom, it's John Green. Thanks again for, for coming on. We really appreciate it. One of the things in researching um, before the show was just how impressive your, your overall record is with some of these, what I would call modestly bred, modest priced horses you buy out of the yearling sale. Heritage of Gold is, uh, you know, was a, a gold legend that you bought for 12000 made $1.9 million. Surrogate the Empress, we're just talking about alternation, $70,000 yearling. But alternation certainly hasn't, you know, hit the, the world on fire yet. Lone Sailor, Majestic Warrior uh, made $1.3 million, Rise Up. Rockport Harbor that made 1.1 and now no parole who, you know, people can say that everyone was excited about violence and the year that you bought no parole, 
there was it was almost impossible to buy a violence. But then he was cold on the racetrack, uh, you know, for the first year or so. So how are you finding these athletes um, that other people aren't because they're they're modestly bred and for the most part, you know, reasonably priced? How are you getting them? How are you finding them, first of all, at the sales? And then how are you able to develop them into these million dollar or grade one winners? Well, most of the horses that you mentioned are horses that we did purchase. Uh, not all of them, but I'm just going to give a general idea of what, what I like to do at the sale. Mo Tom would be another example of a horse that was reasonably priced that did very well. And I appreciate you bringing those horses up. Thank you for that. Um, so when I go to the sale, I am looking at for an athlete. That's, that's what I'm looking for there. And as far as pedigree goes, particularly as it pertains to the sire, I'm not putting a lot of emphasis on that. And I am readily willing to buy a first year sire um, because I think that's where you can get some value. But uh, so let's, as I said, let's take Serengeti Empress as an example. So I remember seeing her for the first time and thinking what a beautiful looking athlete she was, strongly made, proportioned well, smart when she came out of the stall, paid attention to everything around her. So I thought she had the the right attributes. I remember opening my my catalog and I was with the owner at the time, Joel Politi. He took a couple of days off to come to the sale with me. And uh, Joel's got an eye too, by the way. He grew up with horses. So um, he agreed. He liked her as well as I did. And I opened the catalog page. I, I didn't know alternation at all. Uh, I had to look him up. But uh, he wasn't even a grade one winner, which is usually a characteristic that a sire needs to have to make it into the, 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 the arena of breeding to a lot of horses. In any case, uh, he wasn't. But uh, I liked her. And we were going to go to 100K for her. She went for 70. Um, so I, I had her from the moment they dropped the hammer, as is the case with many of those horses you mentioned. And, and, and I think that's a big part of it, too. Being part of the process of getting to the farm, breaking them, getting them learned to uh, a saddle and, 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 and then going, you know, having them all the way from the time they broke into a saddle to when they come to the racetrack and start developing. I, I think that's advantageous uh, for a trainer if he can have that kind of relationship with his horse. Hey, Tom. Uh, great. Thanks for being with us. Uh, talk about your relationship with, with Maggie. You've won countless races for her, uh, a good majority of them of the claiming variety, but you stepped up your game. You won the La Troyenne with her and uh, another Louisiana bred in 2017, Big World. But what sort of satisfaction um, does it bring to you to win a grade one in New York, no less on, on the biggest day, the biggest sports day in New York in some time? But what sort of satisfaction did that give you to win both the grade one in New York and a great one for Maggie. Yeah. So first of all, Alan, it's my pleasure to do the show with you guys. Uh, so I extend that to all you guys. Uh, so I appreciate it very much. But when it comes to a horse like No Parole or Big World, which is the other one you're alluding to, that uh, one with Maggie when I uh, hear Churchill Downs won a great one. Um, you know, you got to go back and, and recognize that 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 Maggie is a very savvy horse owner and plays the claiming game. When we all reflect over the last 20 years, we've seen them come and go. These guys that come in and they're going to rule the world and claim a lot of horses and, and they do it and, and they find out the hard way typically that it's, it's not a moneymaker to, to try to do that. So they either disappear or they get much smaller and racing, but Maggie has stayed the course. She's one of the few that uh, is out there doing it day in and day out albeit a lot tougher now because the claiming game is played by a lot more people than it was 15 years ago when we started together. But she turns a profit, does it year after year, and she's got, you know, a lot of business savvy and in a model to try to make that work. So, uh, you know, our relationship, Maggie, my relationship is probably like brother and sister. I've never had any sister. I got five brothers, but, uh, you know, we, we discuss things. Um, all the time. Um, we talk just basically about every day uh, on cards and what we're looking at. And um, at times the relationship, it's, it's a rocky spot uh, as brothers and sisters do, but we know that we can speak our minds, whether the other one agrees or not. And at the end of the conversation, it's still going to be, you know, the Tom and Maggie show. So, uh, so we're, 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 we're of the same thinking in how we want to do this. I have a very good understanding of what Maggie expects from me. And I think that she has a very good understanding of what she should expect from me. And uh, the bottom line is at the end of the month, every month when I make up the bills, not only for her, but everybody else, I'm always looking 
at what an owner has spent versus what an owner has made for the month. And, you know, that's not a, you know, straight upward trajectory. There are months that are better than others and some that aren't. And, you know, you're always trying to, in the long run, uh, keep your owners above water. It's not always easy to do, but with Maggie, uh, you know, she's, uh, she's shown, she knows how to do it. I wanted to switch gears a little bit. You mentioned being on the Fox show before um, on the Fox sports one broadcast America's day at the races. You do a great job. I think it's, it's good to have that trainer's perspective on the panel. I was wondering if there was anything that maybe you've learned or you've started to look at differently because it's a different vantage point. It's a more analytical vantage point. It's more of an overlook of the sport. And so is there anything that you've learned from doing that broadcast other than how difficult it is to spend a day with Andy Serling? <laughs> Very good. Very good, Joe. Uh, yeah. So look, the, the, the show that we do is, 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 is probably as in-depth a show with the races we feature as any you'll see in horse racing. And so I learn all the time. So we've got, uh, you know, Jonathan kitchen is the guy that makes the bets and knows how to handicap. So I learn a lot of betting strategy from him as we're doing these shows and he presents, presents it to the audience. Uh, you know, um, I mean, look, I, I had an advantage in the COVID crisis in that I've been practicing social distancing from Andy Serling for years. So uh, I knew how to do that. I knew how to do that before it came on, but in seriousness, uh, Andy, does his homework every single day. And if you don't do yours, he's going to make you look, he's going to make you look foolish. So what I like about the show is, and I, and I should be mentioning everybody else as well. Uh, Lafitte Pinkai, Richard Migliori, Greg, uh, Greg Wolf, uh, in the paddock, we've got, you know, what I think is one of the best paddock observers and understanding of what's going on in Maggie Wolfendale, as well as Acacia Courtney, Lafitte Pinkai, I think I mentioned it already, but I don't want to leave anybody out. But my, my point is this, it's a really, really talented group. Uh, we have a very good idea of what we're trying to present to the audience. And, uh, and I think as a group, we do a good job. You mentioned the different perspectives. We get that from Gary Stevens, who does the show with us, a rider's perspective, uh, as well as Richard McLeory. You get my trainer's perspective. So you're, you're, you're able to, I think, even the experienced handicapper incorporate some things in your handicapping that maybe you wouldn't otherwise incorporate. So uh, to me, that that is the that's what makes the show special. I'm proud of the show, and it was put together, of course, by Tony Alivato, who's our boss, who's continually critiquing us, trying to make us better, trying to make us better at presenting our ideas to maybe the casual observer. Because, I mean, look, this is my opinion, Joe. But right now, we have this window. Horse racing has this window to attract some new people to the sport, but no one's going to turn on a show that is where the talk is so over their head that they can't follow along. So um, it, I think it's really, really important as an industry. And of course, when you look at all the different entities that are battling each other in our industry, this probably will never happen. But it's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for our industry to present the sport to a group of people that don't know anything about it and maybe get them attracted to it. So uh, what have I learned from doing the show? I, I've learned to watch my words, um, but, but not stay silent. If, if, I, if there's something I believe uh, no matter whose feelings I might hurt, I'm not out to hurt anyone's feelings. I'm I'm out to to tell you what I see and what I observe. So uh, I, I've learned to have a thick skin as far as that goes, but to say it in the right way. Hey Tom, just like Joe, I'm going to take you down a completely different path here. There's a race uh, at Churchill on Saturday, the fourth race. You have a two year old first time starter by the name of Windcracker in there. And what, the reason why I bring that up is I don't know if this is your first two year old or not. You can answer that uh, if you let me get the rest of the question in. But no Lasix in the race, as there are no uh, Lasix in any two year old races at many tracks, including Churchill Downs. Matter of fact, there'll be a stakes race on the card for two year olds, the Bashford Manor. In uh, most jurisdictions, there, it's really gone off without anybody paying much attention to it. All the other horsemen's groups have remained silent. The horsemen's group in Kentucky has been anything but. They, they filed lawsuits, et cetera. So, um, you know, take it uh, wherever you want to go. But, you know, how do you feel about this new world of having to run two-year-olds without Lasix and then next year having to run stakes horses without Lasix? Well, I think like everyone in horse racing, I've got a strong opinion. And, uh, and, and, and that's, it's a real polarizing thing, isn't it? This Lasix debate, uh, on the one side, there are people that think it shouldn't be allowed. And, you know, and then there's the other side, my side, uh, which I think it should be allowed. And I'm on the front lines. I was in New York as an assistant trainer 
when Lasix was not allowed. Uh, so I know how barns try to deal with no Lasix. They're trying to simulate, you know, what Lasix does. Anyhow, my, my point is this. So I, I have a strong opinion, and my strong opinion is that this is a huge mistake for our industry. But I'm never going to convince anyone on the other side that I'm right and they're wrong. And it's almost like trying to convince a Democrat to be a Republican or a Republican to be a Democrat. So with that in mind, there's a real opportunity here. Um, you know, all these studies are cited for both sides as to, you know, why LASIK should be around or why LASIK shouldn't be around. I find it puzzling that the powers that be, uh, particularly, uh, you know, our medication uh, uh, rules committee that uh, the, uh, I'll think of it in just a second, but uh, why they that conduct all these studies trying to simulate a, a race for different uh, therapeutic medications, I find it hard to believe that we're not taking advantage of an opportunity to put some money up, scope every one of these courses after the race. Now, in today's world, the scopes we use, which is just a little small camera that's dropped down the trachea of the horse to look for blood, they're so small and they actually film now that you could do it in 30 seconds. It's not painful for the horse at all. You're going to get the actual film of what you've seen. So there's no discrepancy on how much the horse bled or didn't bleed. And you could just do it by the horse's tattoo number or chip number. So no horses would be uh, you know, shown to have bled in the race or not. Totally anonymous. And you get the statistics on whether or not this bleeding is occurring in the races that many of us feel is versus it not happening, which many people will also believe. So it's, it, it would end the debate. And um, I, I think in the end, we all want the same thing, which is for the horse to run the best possible race it can run. Uh, I've heard Lasix called a performance enhancer. I prefer to, re I prefer to call the performance enabler. And uh, there are certainly other things that we're allowed to use that enable a horse to run his best race. So, you know, I, I'm, I'll get pushed back on everything I've said, and that's fine. I know the other side totally disagrees with me. But, but why wouldn't we as a group, whether it's the Kentucky Horsemen's Group or any other group for matter, including the racetracks, NYRA, Churchill Downs, why wouldn't we all be after the same goal to find out exactly what's happening in real time with these racehorses? No study needed, no nothing. Just scope the horses after the race and, and see what we've got. To me, that's the answer to this problem. And no one is talking about it, as you said. And Tom, you bring up a very practical point, which is 75% of these horses, I, I would guess, 75 to 80% of these horses after the races are being scoped anyway, um, because you want to know why they flattened out. You're wanting to know, you know, did this medication that I worked or this training technique, you know, that did work, um, you know, ultimately did it affect their, their bleeding? So it's being done anyway. All we're doing is gathering the information. And like you said, if you can do it anonymously, then it's not pointing a finger at anybody and nobody's going to get in trouble if, uh, if a horse bleeds through a medication. Um, one of the things that we talked about on the show, just to, to, to broaden this conversation a little bit, is, you know, the, the Lasix seems like it's a it's a red herring. I mean, you know, in the grand scheme of things, whether you run on Lasix or you don't run on Lasix, you run on something else that's replicating the, the Lasix results. Um, it doesn't matter in comparison to Lattacane positives or other positives for medications that are illegal in the industry. Why do you think that that there's such a um, a, a taboo subject of not going after these guys that are using, allegedly using these illegal drugs. I think that in 2020 and in the years leading up to 2020, probably the last five years, I've been training horses since 1987. And I spent a year before I started training horses as a vet assistant. Uh, so I knew all about medication, how medication can be used properly. Um, and, and the one thing that evolved during the course of time was that the sophistication of cheating increased dramatically. Uh, and, and you can look at the Navarro service um, as, a, as a very good example. But, you know, uh, I, the thing that disappoints me is I went a lot of years under the belief that there wasn't anything happening, that this was a lot of talk about nothing. And, you know, I've got some very good friends at Handicap for a Living, and they, they would push back on that and say, you know, we're handicapping races and seeing results that don't make sense, and it's the same guys every time. So uh, I said this on the NYRA telecast last year uh, concerning a horse named Shecky Shabazz that uh, had won for 25000 claim uh, at Saratoga and was bought privately, turned over to Jason Service, 
and he was now running him in a graded stake off this 25 claim race. It was a turf sprint. So we're covering that race for the show. And, um, you know, we review a lot of replays. I watch a lot of replays. And so Shecky Shabazz, a speed horse that literally was all out to make the lead for the 25K claim race. So I'm like, well, no way he's going to make the lead against this caliber horse. And he makes the lead as easy as can be. And, uh, and he wins. And I'm like, that's a result that doesn't make sense. But it's not my place, nor anyone else's for that matter, to say, hey, I think this guy's cheating. That's, that's, not, that's not the American justice system. You're innocent until proven guilty. That is up to our regulators. Uh, and they need to be well-funded uh, to do that. They need to have the ability to explore and investigate those things. And, um, you know, as far as I know, that's not being done. And I think the resources monetarily have a lot to do with that. But when you got to Shecky Shabazz and him winning that great stake, uh, I said, you know what? I, I remember this movie, a very famous movie called Cinderella Man, where the, this boxer, uh, James uh, Braddock, uh, goes into retirement. And he comes out of retirement and fights a fighter that he'd already lost to before his retirement. And he's beating him. And after a round, the opposing boxer goes back to his ring and the manager says, uh, hey, what's wrong with you? You beat this guy last time. And the boxer says, that ain't the same guy I'm fighting. That's not the same guy as last time. Well, I mean, Shecky Shabazz wasn't the same horse. And that was evident. Now, it's, it, 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 again, it's not my place to stand up and say something. That's wrong because I don't know. You know, I can have my suspicions. But, but the regulators, I mean, I can't think of one regulating body that, that has the strength or the wherewithal to want to go, you know, explore these things. And they need to be explored. I mean, look, many of us are handicappers. If I told each of you guys right now, write down five names of trainers that are getting results that you find that make you scratch your head. And we all did anonymously and we turned them in. The names would probably look identical. Now, does that mean those guys are cheating? No, it does not. You know, I mean, look, ugh, I mean, when you look at the PGA golf tour, Tiger Woods was a, you know, he was an anomaly. He just did better than everybody else. And there are trainers like that too. But getting back to my point, those guys should be looked at. And when you sign to get your license, whether it's in Kentucky or another state, you should be expectant of that and welcome that. If, uh, if, if, if jurisdictions say, hey, you signed this license agreement, and so that gives us the right to do this or that, if it's done in a, you know, a professional manner, I'd, I'd be the first one to sign up to, come on, you know, anything you want to see, anything you want to talk about, we can talk about. I think that needs to happen. The game needs to be one where the handicapper feels what he's looking at on paper and using these horses' resumes to bet on a race and handicap a race, it should be as legit as possible. Uh, I, can, I concern myself that it may not be right now, and that's, that's not a good feeling. Yeah, and, and it's not just handicappers. It's owners. It's trainers. It's breeders that are being affected by, by, by these results. Um, I'm sure, and, and again, we're not going to name names, but I'm sure that when you enter horses, you're looking at the overnight and you're saying, oh, crap, so-and-so has a horse in that race that they just claimed, or that's a horse that, that belies, you know, what, what it's doing, you know, what it should be running for. So, so how do you give the, the, the powers that be that, that kind of wherewithal to be able to, to make sure that people are trainers and not chemists? Yeah, great question. So uh, the first thing is you, 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 when you apply for your application as a trainer in any jurisdiction, it should be part of the process that you're willing to open your doors and allow anyone to look at anything they want to in your barn uh, that they want. That should be something that is a given. And if it does happen, it shouldn't be looked at as a negative towards you. It should be a regular occurrence. We, we should have the ability for regulators to come in, talk to our employees, uh, look at the horses, look in our tack rooms, uh, do anything you want. Open my trunk. If my car is on the backside, open the trunk. Take a look. You know, I, I think I think that's a start. Secondly, how do we fund it? Well, you know, we're running for good purse money here at Churchill Downs, and they're running for good purse money in New York. And so in these bigger jurisdictions, if $100 out of every race went towards something that would work for this, that's not going to hurt anybody. And uh, at the same time, it would be a way to fund something where we could maybe get this going. But, uh, you know, I, I get the idea in some of these jurisdictions that they'd rather not know that it's a black eye. Well, look, you can take a black eye right now 
or you can take, you know, a pummeling, you know, three years later because you chose to ignore it. So, you know, that's another thing, by the way, these penalties. Uh, this is what I strongly believe. Not only should the trainer get penalized, but the owner should get penalized. And more importantly, the horse should get penalized. If you win a maiden race and that horse uh, tests positive and the split comes back positive, well, you forfeit the purse, just like we do now, but you also forfeit the condition. That horse then has to go to the next condition to run. You know, owners are going to pay a lot more attention to where they place their horses and who they have them with. And they're going to put, you know, uh, they're going to have a strong conversation with that trainer if those things are in place. I trained for Ralph Wilson that owned the Buffalo Bills and we became good friends. And when he first hired me, he said, one thing, Tom, don't ever be in a situation where my horses gets a positive test. If that happens, no ifs, ands, buts about it, you'll get fired. And I said, Mr. Wilson, I understand. Well, we never had that, of course. And we had a great relationship till he passed away. But, but, you know, that's the kind of pressure you need to feel from the owners. It starts there towards the trainers and, you know, towards racing in general. Now, I do think the climate's changed. I do think when you get a positive test now, even if it's for a therapeutic medication that just was a mistake in the barn and we're seeing a few of those around, uh, I do think the climate now is is such that, you know, you don't just get to walk away from that. Uh, the public perception of one of those is is is, is going to put a lot of pressure on you to be a lot more careful. Right. Thank you. We appreciate you being candid like that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely preaching to the choir. We had that we had that exact same discussion the week that the indictments came out. We said write down five names of guys that you think are cheating, and there were a lot of the same names. So it's yeah. Wish we would have had. Wish we would have had you on that episode. That would have been right. like, even better. <laughs> and, and Tom, you were not on anybody's list, just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Clear. Um, Al, anything else for Tom? Yeah, just um, if you'll indulge me, uh, I want I want to share two Tom Amos moments from the nineties. Uh oh. First, you know, first was uh, September nineteen ninety five, the Hawthorne Budweiser Breeders Cup. Tom sent out a horse called Maristani, who was <laughs> 19, 19 to ten favorite. And uh, my good friend, Neil Pesson, had coaxing Matt in that race. The, you could drive a truck through the opening at the fence. Coaxing Matt drove through and on to the three-quarter length victory at 26 to 1. So thanks, Tom. Um, and then having men mentioned Mr. Wilson, one of the great races I remember watching and, and captured in a picture on the front page of the Blood Wars was the 1997 Stars and Stripes. Came down to a photo finish between Lakeshore Road and Chief Barrett, and I remember that photo from the cover of the Blood Horse, and those two horses were so in sync. Their strides were exactly synchronized. It was crazy that any horse uh, lost their race, but Chief Barrett went on to be a champion. Uh, Wad was back in, in third that day, so uh, those are good Tom Amos memories for, for me. Um, just want to ask about the, the Breeders' Cup. Uh, you've been shut out today. I'm sure it's something that's uh, high on your punch list, but um, having talked about this earlier with no parole what would it mean to you to get to uh to keeneland this november well i think with any horse getting to the breeders cup is a huge accomplishment so uh you know look there's a very very small percentage of trainers that are going to have multiple horses in the breeders cup every year but for the vast majority of us uh that that's that's a goal and it's it is not easy to to make that happen so uh you know, you talk about no parole, you're talking about Maggie Moss, you're talking about the Louisiana bread program, which I've supported for many years. And you're talking about Greg Tramontine, uh, who has just come aboard. Uh, you know, so all, all those elements of getting no parole to the Breeders' Cup would, would be wonderful. And, um, you know, he very well could face a stablemate long weekend uh, who will run probably in another week and a half or so. But he's a he's an excellent sprinter, too. Um, I'm keeping those two horses away from each other. They kind of have the same style and, and that's easy to do. There's a lot of opportunities out there. So uh, hopefully I'll get to do that. But uh, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I've never won a Breeders' Cup race, uh, you know, in order of importance on what I would like to win before my career is over. If I could have a wish list, obviously the Kentucky Derby would be number one. The Louisiana Derby would be number two. I've won just about every race at Fairgrounds, but I've never won that. I've been favored in it. I've gotten beaten right on the wire in it, but I've never won it. And then uh, third would be a Breeders' Cup race. And, and those, are, those are lofty goals. But, uh, but if any of those happen, that would be wonderful. 
All right, Tom, we can't thank you enough for the time and for all the insights. This was great. Um, keep up the great work on the Fox show. I think you guys do all do a really good job. And uh, best of luck with the big horse this weekend. I appreciate it. Been my pleasure, guys. You all have a Thank you. Appreciate it. Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Tom Amos will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, wagering through Keeneland Select supports Keeneland's efforts to give back to the thoroughbred industry. Learn more at KeenelandSelect.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Tom Amos, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Anthony LaRocca and Danny Seiper, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Stay safe out there. We will see you next week. Mm-hmm.